Okay. Why don't we get started? Diane uh, will be back in a sec. Yeah. So this uh, segment is diagnostic and therapeutic controversy. You've, you've all submitted questions, and of course, as we talk and more questions come to mind, feel free to add those into the mix. Um, the other point is I've gotten a couple of requests that when people do talk, that you speak again very loudly. And maybe if you're in the front of the room, it's worth turning around and addressing the back. Uh, um, <coughs> so somewhat randomly, I've picked this question, which I, I think is a good one. Pneumothorax, when to intervene and what to intervene with traumatic and spontaneous. Um, so I, I can tell you we're still in my shop mostly doing chest tubes, although the um, smaller ones are now in vogue. Uh, I have yet to do or see anyone do a straight aspiration. I know I've heard Jerry talk about that and I think the British Thoracic Society still recommends that as the initial approach. Um, but I've not done it. I, I'm fascinated by the concept. So we have at our place a trauma surgeon named Ken Giannava who's done a bunch of research uh, in this area. And we're definitely sort of watching. So the incidentaloma pneumothorax found that's, you know, a small 5% found on a trauma patient. We're now pretty much non-interventional headed for those with the proviso that if they're going to get positive pressure ventilation, um, there may be a little more liberal approach towards putting chest tubes in. We also have gone away from the garden hose, you know, the old idea that you need to put in a 36 or a 40 French, because if you put in a smaller tube, the blood will coagulate in the tube and the drainage will cease, like there's going to be some big plumbing problem. Uh, we've gone, uh, we keep going down in size and chest tubes, and we're putting in a lot of sort of 24s and things like that, um, and putting them in a little less traumatically and a little more care. Um, the rationale behind that is, you know, sometimes when you pull a big chest tube, the lung just falls back down again, you know, after day three because of the magnitude of the cavern that you've created. So the, the idea of them having a good seal when you pull the tube is harder to achieve. So we're definitely going to smaller tubes. For spontaneous pneumothoraces, again, if they're small, we'll do nothing. And if they're larger, we've really gone uh, completely to either aspiration, done pretty rarely, or to Heimlich tubes. And we've also gone away from where we placed the Heimlich tubes. We used to place them in the anterior middle third of the clavicle, second intercostal space, which is pretty an uncomfortable place for a patient to have a Heimlich um, valve hanging off them. And we've gone to a lateral placement technique, sort of just anterior to the you know, the heavy musculature, so we look for sort of a thin place in the chest wall and place those so there. there. There is a fairly robust literature. It's not thousands of patients, but many, many small studies um, which show the following, that if you place a chest tube, a large 40 French chest tube in a pneumothorax, you have about a 10, 15, 20% chance of a failure, which means you have to put in a second tube or you have to reposition or something, or it has to be in for a long time. If you put in a Heimlich valve, you have about a 10, 15% chance of a failure, which means you need to do something else. If you, if you put in a small chest tube, you have a 10 or 15% chance of a failure. If you just aspirate, just take the air out and let it sit there, about 10 or 15 percent of the time you'll have to do something else. And if you do nothing, it doesn't always work. Maybe 10 or 15 percent of the time you have to do something else. Um, what predicts failure? Um, spontaneous predicts failure. It's sort of interesting. People often think of, oh well, traumatic is worse. But no, traumatic is better because there was a cause. and it gets better. Whereas if it was spontaneous, it's often because they have something wrong with their lung. They have lung disease, they have blebs, and those are the people who are most likely to go on to have problems. So whatever your approach is, uh, they're going to do fine, the large majority, and a few people are going to need something, which to me suggests that you should, do minim you should be a minimalist. And um, so for years, I didn't do nothing because that we're not allowed, you know, we're mostly not allowed to do that. Um, 
so uh, maybe I think that probably intellectually it may be best to just leave them alone. And the, Brit the Brits have, and many of these studies are from Britain, by the way, the Brits have done nothing even with 60% pneumos. And guess what? They heal. Um, if the patient isn't symptomatic, they're going to get better. But what I did for many, many years, I'm sure I did it with you, Tess, is uh, aspirate. You know, just take it out and just sit, sit there and see what happens. And if two hours later the lung is still up, you're done. And, um, but most of my colleagues don't do that. Most of them at UCLA, what they did was Heimlich valve, which, you know, I can't argue with. Uh, they're, they're all fine. The, but the one thing I don't think is reasonable is putting in a, a giant test tube. And the last thing I'll just mention is that Billy makes a really important point about these trivial pneumothoraces, and particularly what's sometimes defined as an occult pneumothorax, which means you only see it on a CT scan, you don't see it on a, on a plane film, that there is the notion that if you're going to intubate that patient and give positive pressure for ventilation, something bad could happen. But when I first thought of that, that I thought, could that really be true? Because in the days before CT scan, we didn't know about these pneumothoraces, and a lot of those patients went to the OR and nothing bad happened. So how could it be that it really is bad? And there, are, there isn't a lot of literature on this, but there is a small literature. There are about three, two or three studies which said, you know what, we're not going to do anything with those occult pneumothoraces, and nothing bad happens. One out of 100 they need in the OR to put in a chest tube. But the large majority, nothing bad happens. Yeah, and Kenji's paper, mechanical ventilation, one of his papers, mechanical ventilation, did predict um, an increasing size of the pneumothorax, but they waited for an increasing size to do something. They didn't automatically say, we're intubating them, ergo chest tube. They said, we need to know there's a pneumothorax here. This person needs to be watched a little more carefully. And if they develop new symptoms and, and an increasing size of chest tube, then so what about it, you an guys? increasing intervention will intervene. What do you do? do? Are there people, is anybody who's just saying a small pneumo, leave it, watch it? Small pneumos, leave it, let's see hands. I think, it, I think that that's reasonable now. And how about, how about anybody doing aspiration where you just put in a big, you know, you put in an IV, a big IV, take out the needle, draw it back, and expand the lung and leave it there? So some, one or two, one maybe, aspirator. I, I did that for most of my career. And Heimlich valves? I bet there's a bunch there. Heimlichs? One of the interesting options for the Heimlich valve is the potential you send the patient home with the valve in place. Yeah, oh, we send them home yeah, all the oh, time. Yeah. The yeah, other that's thing the I, good thing about yeah. not chest tubes is you send them home. So, the so the other thing that comes up in this that I think is always uh, worth noting is when it's not an acute pneumothorax, when that lung has been down, and particularly if it's a pretty complete, you know, more than 60% pneumothorax, in a patient with lung diseases, you, the history suggests, geez, it might have been down for 10 days. Every once in a while on those, and, and there's, it's, it's a, a kind of a rare event, but when it happens, it's horrible. If they get their lung suddenly reinflated, they get bilateral reinflation pulmonary edema, and they usually die of it. Um, so if you think that the lung's been down a long time, there's reason to have caution. In those patients, we specifically put in a Heimlich tube where we're going to reinflate it in small incremental amounts. So we're going to reinflate it 100 cc's, wait four hours, reinflate it another 100, 150 cc's, wait four hours. But if you want to do that, you do have to remember to put the three-way stopcock in the Heimlich. Some of the Heimlich kits come with a three-way stopcock, but more of the newer ones come with a, just a two-way stopcock, which makes it, it's either open and you're withdrawing or it's closed. And that's not, you, you need the three-way if you want to do gradual reinflation. So if you're, if, you, if you're worried about reinflation, pulmonary edema, I've only seen it twice in my career. Both patients died. We've had a couple of events where we, um, where other clinicians at my hospital have encountered it. You know, over a 25-year period, I would say that we're talking about in a huge ED seeing 200,000 a year over, over a 15-year period, this has happened maybe five times. So I don't want to get, make you think this is a really common thing. It's mostly older, older patients, a lung that's been down for a long time with pre-existing pulmonary disease where someone forged ahead with a big barrel chest tube and reinflated them all at once. And then, boom, this pulmonary, and it's non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The heart isn't dilated, Lasix, inotropes won't work, and it's, it's horror. I've seen it happen. And man, is it, it'll scare the, you'll, you'll think, you'll start asking, all it only takes once to make you ask a little more questions about how long this lung might have been down. 
You can get a similar effect with a large pleural effusion if you drain yep. the whole and we thing. Had, we had one of our M&M cases recently where someone drained four liters out of a lung that had been there for a long time, and then the patient went into reinflation pulmonary edema. Yeah. Uh, that a couple, one lived. A couple of people asked about AFib in the ED, and I, I think of, for a common condition, looking at practice variation, you're not going to probably find more of a range for almost anything that we do. It, of course, ranges from rate, to rate control to rhythm control, admission, discharge, anticoagulate, don't anticoagulate. So as far as I know, no particular pathway has been clearly shown superior, which, like Diane said in one of her talks, when there are 20 ways of doing things, that'll tell you that there's no clear superior way that's been proven. So uh, I, I can tell you what. I do. I'm sure other people will be happy to tell what they do, but I can't tell you that any bit's any better. Um, I think if what you do decreases rate of admission, then one could argue if you can't find an outcome difference, then keeping people out of the hospital is a decent marker of quality. Uh, but some of this probably also has to do with your outpatient follow-up potential. But and you can keep people out of the hospital with any of these approaches. So you, you don't have to get somebody in sinus rhythm to keep them out of the hospital. You can keep them out of the hospital if, you've if they're not sick underlying, you don't have a bad cause for the sudden onset of AFib, and they're not symptomatic. So what you have, and that typically means you have to get their rate controlled, whether you do it by rhythm control or just rate control, as long as they're going slow, they're not gonna be so reasonable. Always keep in mind the caveat that going too slow is a really dangerous part of, of AFib. So if somebody comes in with nuance at AFib and they're going slow, they better be on a, a drug that's making them go slow or you better be worried because that's a really high risk situation. But the, the typical one, they go in, they've got a rapid ventricular response. However you get that response back to normal, that's your job because that's what's causing them problems. They're going too fast. And if you do that by by converting them electrically or with drugs, or you do it by slowing them down with drugs. Once you've got them okay, if you're not worried about a bad cause, they can go home. And in, America, in the United States, we've traditionally admitted all sorts of AFibs. And in many other places, I assume you guys, certainly in Canada, um, they, they don't. And they don't do it just because they put them back in sinus rhythm. They don't admit them when they're back in sinus rhythm, but they also don't admit them when they're not back in sinus rhythm. And so it's not a matter of did you get them into sinus rhythm, it's did you get them stable. The one thing I would always say, we, we always have this conversation, AFib, and, and sometimes there's a lot of confusion about that because we don't stop and say, well, what kind of AFib do you mean first? So there is a lot of different kinds of AFib out there. I see AFib from people drinking monster drinks. You know, it's a young person studying for, you know, they come in with either PSVT or AFib because they have caffeinism. I see AFib from alcohol withdrawal. Those are totally different animals. Um, you got to hold them aside. Those are younger, healthier people without cardiac disease where it's a stimulant-related problem. Then there's AFib with valvular disorders. We, because we have an immigrant population, again, we have a lot of mitral valve dis disease with, with left atrial dilatation. That's, that person's going to be an AFib. There's no point in converting them. Their, their left atrium is 55 millimeters across. It's stretched out. It's going to have AFib. So converting that, taking a, a rhythm control approach with that patient is a complete exercise in futility. So you, you really first, before you have the AFib conversation, have to say what kind of AFib you mean. Um, generally, we're talking about someone who probably has some underlying cardiac disease, whether it's a hypertensive cardiomyopathy or something like that. And if you want to have that conversation, then I agree with everything that's been said here. But I think a more important thing to do is to recognize that all AFib ain't created equal. First, let's talk about what kind of AFib it is because that often informs the decision-making about what you should do. I think most people who have AFib, at the end of the day, maybe 10 years down the line, they're chronically in AFib. So yep. anything we do up front to rate or rhythm control is often temporizing. But yet, from an ED perspective, it's temporizing in a very nice way because suddenly you can cure the patient, the, rhythm, the, the rate is controlled with the rhythm control, and it does make it easier to discharge the patient. If you're trying to do rate control, 
what I've seen happen a lot is people just go immediately to something like IV diltiazem, and yeah. diltiazem seems to have been the, uh, the, the specific calcium channel blocker marketed for AFib. But in any case, um, that will wear off. So I think we often paint ourselves in a corner that we, we just do boluses of IV, and then what do you do if you're going to try to discharge the patient? So I think at some point you've got to start an oral agent. Most people are still recommending a short duration oral agent like the short acting diltiazem that you still have to give QID. We often go to the SR actually at our place, but I agree with you. So, cause we're going to try and discharge them. So we'll go to a longer acting agent, see if they hold their control. The other thing I will just say, and, and my residents would complain um, that, you know, it's Billy, he's a magnesiophile. I see people having this thing, well, it's diltiazem or mag. And, you know, in the critical care literature, the mag, I don't know, what do you mean diltiazem or mag? It's diltiazem and mag. And part of that reflects how much alcoholism I have in my department. But it's diltiazem and mag, and then sort of converting to sort of a longer-acting agent that might get them out the door. But I'm a big believer if I put the two grams of mag up with the diltiazem, I often don't need to start the diltiazem drip, which is partly an issue of nursing resources if I don't have enough nurses around and things like that. It means a pump and some other headaches. So I like to bolus them down with the, my, I, I hang the two grams of mag up over whatever, 30 minutes. I'm going to start in with a few boluses of diltiazem until I get where I think is good. And then I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to start them on an SR agent and hope to get them home, presuming no other you know, comorbidities or problems. The other issue that always comes up with these patients, and I don't want to spend forever on this, but is, you know, do you have to have had an echo today to verify there's not a clot there if you're going to go for rate control? And that's been looked at a bunch of times by Ian Steele and their crowd and, other, and others that say that the incidence of throwing a clot in these patients is pretty, pretty low. 0.03%, is that it? One in 300? Something like that? Question? That sounds like a pretty extended ED state by the time you get their rate to somewhere you're comfortable starting on a, on a ball acting agent and then you're comfortable with them going home. What's, what's your ED I'm talking, it's usually, and you're correct, we're talking about, you know, four hours minimum, six hours not uncommonly. Well, you're talking about a place where they ne you don't even see them for the first <laughs> yeah. 12 hours. Um, I, you know, I don't think, I like AFib because it's easy. You know, we, it's one of those, I love diseases that we make better in the ER. And once you control their rate, um, they're better. And that's, that's lovely. They like it, you like it. Uh, th these are not patients you're going to greet in the street in 20 minutes, but I, I don't think it takes hours and hours. It takes a couple hours and, and you can have, you, you, and remember also a lot of this is, these are people who need follow-up. None of these are, except for the, the kid who's got um, holiday heart, these are people who need follow-up. So oh, you're going to need to, you need to have a system. So you need to talk to the, to the follow-up doctors. What, how should we do this? What drug should we be sending them out on? I don't think we should be deciding that. We should just talk with them about it. Which, do you want, do you want us on a long-acting calcium blocker? Some of them want beta blockers, et cetera. I'm a big fan of calcium blockers. I think it's the way to go for this. And yeah. I, take Billy's point that magnesium can be very helpful, um, but it's not my first drug. My first drug is calcium blocker. And, um, and I also, you know, there are some patients and some of their doctors who want it to be, want to get them electrically cardioverted. And I have no problem with that, although I don't think it's necessary. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what they said right at the beginning, which is that um, there's a million ways to do this and they all work and just find one that your group and your, your follow-up doctors are comfortable with and we do really, really well because um, the patient feels better. They, 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 they didn't like it. Now they're feeling better. You feel better. Everything's good. Uh, One other caveat is least. just keep an eye out for they recently had a dye study two weeks ago, and this is thyroid dysfunction causing it. So, again, a TSH is nice. And so many people are getting dye studies nowadays. And two weeks later, they have a tachydysrhythmia, and AFib is one of the tachydysrhythmias they get. So uh, in our world, where imaging is ever-present and happening in an outpatient setting and from the office and other things, you see a new nuance at AFib in a relatively young person. Ask if they've had a dye study recently, and if they had, they need a TSH. One other thing I want to just comment on is David said something about 
Diltiazem is the is the calcium blocker of choice. Anointed. It's been yeah, anointed, anointed yeah. for, for this. And it just it is another of these great examples of of a drug that there's absolutely no difference between diltiazem and verapamil for our purpose. And this is pure marketing. Has you know, verapamil came around when it was the first one and it was available for SVT and then diltiazem came along, they had to have something that they were better. So they Pretend that it was better for um, less the, hypotension was exactly, the marketing exactly the same. With respect to rate control, you also have to realize that this can be done incrementally over time. So, probably an improvement in the ED, but yet still tachycardic, is okay to send home. Kind of, I mean, I, I see it somewhat akin to hypertension. So you get the patient who's markedly hypertensive. We know we don't need to fix that. Maybe we start them on something, but an incremental approach and achieving control over time is appropriate. And additionally, the, the targets have changed over the years. There was a study published in the New England Journal a few years ago looking at tight rate control versus a more liberal strategy, and people did just fine with the more liberal strategy as well, which I think is a heart rate of more like 110 or so. So you don't have to, I mean, we're always so concerned about, well, they're still tachycardic, can they go home? I think this is a population they probably can. I also tend to start a, an anticoagulant, so I, I'll usually start warfarin, but I often am seeing these patients in a closed system of the Kaiser loop, and we have, I, I can send a note to the anticoag clinic, and they will pick up the ball the next day. Again, okay, this is yeah. something that I don't think you should decide for yourself. This should be a, a, a group policy. This is what we do in these patients. And most patients who are uh, in AFib, new onset AFib, um, most patients do ultimately benefit from anticoagulation. There is an exception, which is young people with no structural heart disease. And so in a young person with just a first episode, or certainly one where you have an, a reason, I wouldn't do that because anticoagulation is a big deal. But for, for most people, older people, they're going to end up on it anyway. So if you have a system in place, it's a reasonable thing to do. Right. The, the things that I sort of, I, all, I agree with all of this jazz, but the couple of things that I've sort of learned over the years about AFib is that is to reiterate Billy's not all AFib is the same. We send, tend to approach the EKG rather than the patient. Um, and the patient it really does determine a lot of what you do. Uh, if you have a risk for valvular disease causing that AFib, you're going to deal with that person completely differently than somebody who's been drinking monster drinks. And, and that also kind of bleeds over a little bit into anticoagulation. One of the big pushes right now in our community is the novel anticoagulants for people with chronic AFib to prevent stroke. And that's bleeding itself down into the ED. And you may have some of your consultants recommending you start that in the ED for these patients, and I don't recommend it. Um, those drugs have not been approved for valvular AFib anticoagulation, and you don't know yet if it's valvular AFib fib until you get the patient worked up completely. So I really, even though it's so tempting to stick them on one of these things that it's one pill, nothing gets measured, it works reliably, etc., it's not approved for people with valvular AFib. And the ads make it very clear. If you have AFib not of a valvular clause, so until we you don't know, know that not right. of a valvular cause, you're not in the Zaban territory. <laughs> We have a theoretical question that I've wondered myself, and I will uh, give this one to Jerry. How do you teach patients the concept of overdiagnosis? Oh, God. In, in like 30 seconds or less. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a script that you Trust just Trust me. So. <laughs> I'm a doctor. Uh, <laughs> I, the, Good move. <laughs> Power move. I love it. Are you ready to check in? Oh, no. I deliberately don't check cardiac no, no, markers. No. As I mentioned in one of my talks here, the, with the new high, sensitive, high sensitivity troponins, you, have, you run a very high risk that if you send in your troponins, uh, it'll come back positive. In fact, I admitted, I, I think I mentioned we have an OBS unit, I think a week ago, a colleague of mine did exactly that patient, and it was sort of this mid-ground troponin elevation. Yeah. And 
I had to put the patient in OBS and write OBS orders overnight. And I deliberately said, I am not rechecking a troponin in the morning. This is not acute coronary syndrome. Uh, it's certainly an entirely different mechanism than oh, you know, okay. pl plaque rupture and so forth. So if there's a little bit of stress on the heart for a heart rate of 150, I would expect that. I don't need to know the troponin. Right, on the other a, hand, a, if chest pain is the primary yeah. part of their presentation, and they had underlying IFib, AFib before, uh, that, that, you know, then, I mean, again, we're back to the, it's not just about the EKG, it's about the patient. If they have a, if, they, if chest, you know, if they come in for palpitations or I feel my heart fluttering, I'm not checking one. If so, chest right, pain, the, old, the old teaching was, though, 25 years ago, that nuance at AFib could be caused by a, a, a silent heart attack and you needed to check yeah. for enzymes. And that's, that's gone. That, that, as far as not, if there's no symptom to make you think, other than nuance at AFib, you don't go there. So I, I will briefly answer the, the question about how do you talk about overdiagnosis by just saying the following. It's a hard concept, and it's really a hard concept for a lot of reasons, including that we have taught patients, we have taught our society and ourselves a, a lot of mythologic beliefs that we fundamentally believe that we never challenge that just happen to be wrong, like more is better, and technology will solve the problem, and earlier is better, and information is power. These are all things that we fundamentally believe that happen not to be true. And so it's really hard to get people to think differently about that. It's hard to get ourselves to think differently about it. How could it be that it's not better to find it out early? Well, it just is. And we could, I could, you know, we could go through the math of why it is. But, um, so I, I don't think it's easy, and um, we've got to acknowledge that. There's a second big problem is that um, in America, in the United States, this is particular to the United States where we have such a broken non-system, um, we have a lot of marginalized patients who, for very good reason, do not trust us. And when you say to a patient who is used to, has a long history of feeling like they've been excluded, when you say to such a patient, you know, you, you, this test really isn't good for you, what they hear is, you're trying to cheat me out of what I deserve just because I'm poor or I'm black or whatever. And, um, and I understand that. They're right. I mean, I <laughs> their, their inclination is a good one. So it can be really, really hard. I don't want to make it that it's simple. Uh, I don't want to go through, here's exactly what I say, but I, I just do want to say, on the other hand, I don't think it's an insurmountable thing. So uh, the phrase, I, the I one mean, phrase that I use when I'm trying to get to, and I don't call it an overdiagnosis, I don't try to introduce that whole term, but what I will say to them is, is that sometimes tests let, lead us to chase our tails, where you don't get any benefit from it. And I, I, you know, I tell them I want to avoid and, and so I use, for my English speakers, I use the chasing your tail um, as a sort of a lay phrase that is my sort of code for what happens with overdiagnosis. And that, that sounds like a reasonable thing, but I, for me, you got to, it's, it's all individualized. You have to do it differently with each person. And, you know, just like any teaching anybody anything, you have to be sensitive to the learner and you have to sort of pick up cues about what is it that they're hearing and what can you say differently. But the concepts you want to tell them are, you know, it turns out if we got this information, we wouldn't really know what to do with it. That's one concept, and, and that might lead to harm, And because there's all these things like chasing your tail, that could be harm. A second uh, uh, thing you want to do, include in your notion is, you know what, and if we don't find it out now and we have to change our mind, we're here. We can always decide to get the test later. It's not, it's not urgent now. So that concept of, you know, I could be wrong. It might turn out we, we do eventually want it. A third is the test is, can, do, can, can cause problems. Um, and the fourth one is um, I wouldn't want this test. If I were you, I wouldn't want the test. And the fifth one, the hidden one is, and see, I have gray hair. Which is he has a really, more, more sway than I it's do. It's a really, really important one. Um, especially when I work at a, at, at a place where most of the doctors are seven years old. <laughs> <laughs> the patient is so happy to see me when I walk in because <laughs> I got a, an adult. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I, I think patients understand things in terms of their daily lives. So one of the things I like to do is to say, you know, honestly, if I were walking down the street and found a penny, would you bend over and pick up a penny? But would you bend over and pick up a $10 bill? Well, I'm looking for the $10 bills. I'm not looking for the pennies here. And they really understand that. 
that part is like, well, of course you, why would you go? I wouldn't spend any time worrying about a penny, but I would if it's $10. And they get that idea of the value of something that we might get from a test in a way that makes sense in their lives. What if it's um, a lucky penny? Yeah. <laughs> So this no, is like not e- it's not easy, and sometimes you can't do it. Sometimes I give up, but um, but it, but don't give up on everybody because my experience, especially, you know, if you can play the, you know, I've been doing this a long time, and I'm not really worried, and blah blah blah. If you can get their trust, um, actually, a lot of patients get it. Actually, I had the I I was on the receiving end of this overdiagnosis sort of milieu recently when my husband had his surgery. He had to be pre opt and one of the things I want to do in pre-op, because he has high cholesterol, this is not hip, but he told me I could say this, um, is that he needed to get a cardiac workup. So he got an EKG, which had a couple PVCs. So I got a treadmill, which had a couple more PVCs, one of which coupled. And the cardiologist said, we need to do more tests. We need to do a MIBI. We need to do, and I was like, stop. My husband is totally healthy. He's never had chest pain in his life. Stop. What if you find something that isn't pertinent right now? Well, what if something happens when he's had his surgery? I said, I'll take, we'll take that risk. You know, stop, stop. Quit looking for things that honestly aren't important. And it, it, ta- and it, was, and it was awfully uncomfortable. This is a cardiologist I know I've worked with for a really long time. And it got pretty uncomfortable. He said, but this is my responsibility. And what if? I said, but can't we decide the what if here? We've decided that the what if isn't important right now. These PVCs are nothing. They're really nothing. It, it, was, it was an interesting experience to be on the physician to physician end of this. So you have but, to kind of stand your ground even on the receiving end of so stuff. So you're asking a different question, which is how do you, convi- how do you say something to the doctor <laughs> as opposed to how does it? No, we're all, this is something which we all have to struggle with because we've all been taught these myths. And, and again, I, you know, I like to use the metaphor of the needle in the haystack. We're so worried about what we missed, but we don't think about how much harm do we do finding that miss? It's a little bit like um, there's somebody trapped in the avalanche. Even if you really, there's somebody out there and you'd like to go save them. But the weather conditions are that four helicopters will crash in order to save that one. You know, much though you really want to save that one, overall it's, it's stupid. and in, in, for most of what we do, it isn't even, I know that person's there where it's really hard not to go save them. It's, it's about someone out there, someone in the universe is going to, one person will benefit, nine people will be harmed. Why would we do that? So it's, this is a concept that we have to struggle with because we've all been taught these myths. And um, it's not easy, but I, it's not hopeless at all. A couple of people asked, uh, TPA for PE. Cool. Is anybody out there, have you actually given TPA in the ED for uh, PE? Oh, yeah. So, the, so the, actually, the TPA for PE question isn't that simple. <laughs> so the TPA for PE question, somebody's coding in front of me? Absolutely. Okay. I can't get their blood pressure up? Absolutely. They're profoundly hypoxic. I can't fix that. Maybe. The worry, or not the worry, the thing right now that's happening, and actually I'm kind of curious about the panel, is this sort of moderate-sized PE, risk of down the line of secondary pulmonary hypertension, lysing that now, does that make a difference? And, and um, there's some literature that was kind of bandied about recently. Our residents were all over it like flies on a rib roast. They were just all over this thing. Um, and I'm not sure that that's, the, that's where the practice is kind of may be going and I'm kind of curious what people are doing now. So so my understanding of that so this whole thing's you know they start first off the concept is the only indication for TPA is the they're dying or having serious end organ damage of the of the current PE. That's why you do it. And at one point they liberalized this to include right heart strain, persistent tachycardia, ST changes and when they liberalized the indication for TPA, my understanding, not having all the numbers at my fingertips, was that the outcomes were a little bit worse, leading to a retreat back to sort of the original indications for TPA in a PE, which is hypotension that's not responding to a simple fluid challenge, um, uh, a cardiac arrest, um, serious um, respiratory distress requiring intubation and other things. So they really have to, they've gone back to the, you're really dying of this PE. You're dying of this PE, I gotta lice this PE. And the more liberal strategy of looking at an EKG for some ST changes, tachycardia, right heart strain, 
you know, looking at the echocardiographic evidence of right heart strain, is there septal bowing or a massively dilated, you know, all of those softer indications have, to, at least to my mind, been in retreat because the 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 benefit of TPA in those but that was the acute benefit. This this question. argument that's coming up now is this more long term benefit right. of yeah, preventing pulmonary hypertension and what it's led first. to. Right, <laughs> that's but that's our but but I do wor- I don't I haven't changed my practice at all. But what it has led to that especially in a teaching institution where everybody's trying to keep up on the literature is now our pulmonologists and our intensivists are asking for somebody who has a DVT up proven symptoms that would go with a PE. But I already have the clot. I already know they have a clot. I'm not going to go ahead and image their chest. What they're asking us to do, which I won't do at this point, but is, is to image their chest to determine clot burden so that they can determine whether they want to lyse that person to prevent the down-the-line secondary pulmonary hypertension. And I think that's many iterations of maybes that I'm not sure are clear at so there, all. And there's one other thing you can do, and our, you have to have a cardiologist who's willing to do it, and our cards people are. If you have a, a P that's causing some pretty adverse effects, but they aren't quite there, they'll take them to the cath lab. Now, that allows, one, more accurate administration of the TPA, but two, it allows some other things that you might not thinking, which is aspiration of the clot or fragmentation of the clot, mechanical fragmentation of the clot to move it distally um, to a subsegmental position. And so our CARDS people have demonstrated their willingness to give you a couple other options and, and take, take the imaging away from the CTPA zone and take that imaging to the cath lab. And I'm fine with that a strategy as well. So, n- none, so unfortunately, in most of what we do in medicine, we don't know the answer. And most of the literature that's written doesn't tell us the answer because none of this is large-scale randomized trials which look at people who got TPA and randomized people not to get TPA and then figure out which group did better in the short term, moderate term, long term. We don't have any such information. The biggest advocates of TPA for PEs have acknowledged that there is not good evidence that it does any of the things that we want it to do, including save lives. There isn't. Now, the absence of evidence doesn't mean that it's not true. There isn't evidence that it doesn't. We just don't know. So a lot of this is theoretical. And, and you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, which, which would you do, which makes sense. But let's at least recognize that that has gotten us into a lot of trouble in the past. Which one makes sense? What physiologically should it sound like? And I, the best evidence for TPA for doing, for thrombolysis for doing any of these things is we gave it to some patients and they seemed to do well but maybe better than we thought they would have done but um, be very careful because that also always as we are wont to do fails to look at what about the people who did worse what about the people who didn't ha- it turned out they didn't have a PE because you're giving it to somebody because they're dying and it could be a PE what about the people who stroked out I mean there's a lot of potential downsides and so we're, I think we're mostly just guessing. As my understanding of the literature is a little bit closer to what Billy said, um, which is that we don't know for sure. There certainly isn't evidence proving one or the other, but it looks like um, when you start l- lowering the indications, the amount of harm is pretty substantial and the amount of potential better if it is, is smaller, therefore, because you're doing it in less sick patients. And the notion that it will save you downstream consequences like pulmonary hypertension or in the legs like chronic uh, venous disease, that's been around for a while. And what hasn't been around for a while is some publications that saying, we think we gave it and we think they're doing better, but none of it's proof. Yeah, the, what Diane's talking about in part is the MAFA trial, which is yeah. a half-dose TPA administration. Um, and that did look specifically at the long-term pulmonary hypertension outcome as measured, I think, really just by echo. A lot of people have called into question those results, and I, as far as I know, that's really the only study purporting to show significant See, long-term you, benefit. Right. This, is, this is mostly, I, Mikey likes it. We gave it, we, th- we liked it. And then there was another study recently that was in the database that looked at full dose, and it was essentially a wash. So they had some improved outcomes on the pulmonary front, but much higher, well, at least they had a, a notably higher intracranial hemorrhage rate. And at the end of the day, they said, 
It's kind of a wash, but when you throw in the icy hemorrhage, uh, maybe not. And I never understand this half dose, full dose. So there's looking at half dose TPA versus full dose TPA. But if you're going to heparinize a, a, a PE, it's 18 per kilo. It's the high dose. So I, I don't even know where you get to the half dose idea of the TPA. There was a comment over here. I, I was first wondering, um, I just remember you were talking about a patient with code. I mean, this is someone that we've said this is not an MI. For some reason, we don't think this is stroke, and we're coding the patients. So now we're no, this is not. This is not a. I think so. Actually, there's some data. It looks like PEA codes, and how many of those people actually have PEs, and if giving lytics actually helps. It's like no, a there are a couple of people have done that. There's yeah. a German study talking about you. You really have a high. High the suspicion. person's at high risk for PE. You think it's a PE and right. they're coding. Right. What, what else can you do besides CPR and running your code? And the answer is sure. Go ahead and hit them with a lytic. Right. You don't have a CTPA. No. No. How But you can ultrasound their heart in the middle of the code. And if they're in PEA with a dilated right ventricle and septal bowing, I'm, at, I'm on T minus zero launch for the TPA in that mm -hmm. setting. And that's a very different patient than what you three are talking about, where you've got time and you know, you're looking at right. down. I mean, that's not even an ER treatment in most cases. Yeah. Yeah, the literature often talks about the massive PE and then what's being called sub-massive sub PE. And, and various definitions, but they'll see, you know, right heart strain or elevated troponin or elevated BNP, something along those lines. And again, even in those patients, what you'll read is we had somebody and they had this, all these bad signs and we gave it and they woke up. But what we don't hear is what about, were there other patients where they might have woken, awakened had we not used it, but they didn't, we don't know that. Yeah. So, the, the, you know, it, when you're desperate, you try all sorts of stuff. But I always remind people that there are examples, including one we did recently, I'm not gonna get into the details, where it looks so terrible, you can't have a worse outcome, and so they did a, a, a very aggressive final thing, and actually the outcomes were terrible in the group that didn't get it, and even worse in the group that got it. Comment here, and then we'll come to you. So, oh, this was uh, ICP, intractable ICP taken off the part of the show. Yeah. The success rate of, I don't know if we have good data on that. Again, I mean, you, some one, might, one might ask, I think you're, you're asking, a, you're, you're suggesting a really interesting thing, which is at what point do we in our society, which patients do we say, you know what, death is not optional. Death actually happens and sometimes the patient's going to die. Again, if you're going to give TPA in this situation and you're somebody Well, we've had we've had some survivors. I don't know if they would have survived without the TPA. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know the percentage offhand, and the German papers that talk about it. There's a couple of them that have some some numbers. I don't that think they anybody knows the percent because know, honestly, that's not known. a studied thing. That's a kind of like a reported thing we did. It's it's actually not. It's to randomize a study for people who die of a documented PE who get lysed, it, it, it would be impossible. We'll never Pretty know Pretty uncommon. Yeah. But you're right, your, your basic point is right. This is, you know, this is done on sort of a belief that maybe we could save somebody. It's not based on, we, we can prove this at all. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Yeah. So it's it's this is obviously going to be very institution specific in terms of who your cardiologists are, what their skill set is, what they're comfortable with, who are your cardiothoracic people, how engaged and available are they. So all of those answers are going to be fairly institution specific. And even in a given institution like mine, where they've created a policy that if it's a sick PE, please feel free to engage us. It's going to be cardiologist on call variable in terms of their willingness to say, yep, we're going to package that up and take it. So, you know, that's just the nature of the game because, again, we're in unproven territory. Um, if the cardiologist on call thinks they're part of the solution, I'm happy to engage them. And remember, again, we, this is another example of the millions of examples of we, we look at what would be the benefit of doing something, but we never look at what's the harm of it. And 
this is obviously something where there is harm. Now, when you start out with they're in cardiac arrest, it's hard to make that worse, but it's not impossible because some cardiac arrest survives. So it, we're making it up as we go along. Are you able to get over two hours? Because if you bolus it, you know, you can have a, a certain enzyme. So we're bolusing. We're bolusing. We're bolusing. Just give it all at once. In, in the code tank. situation. I talked to a pharmacist before. They said that if you bolus it all at once, that I forgot what the name of the enzyme is, but it basically metabolizes all of it. Yeah, but Billy and I are both giving it in the code situation, so you're just going to give it. And or near code. Right. Yeah. And then I, I guess the other thing just to say about PE is just uh, that has not much to do with this discussion, but just a reminder of the presentation that a full 10 or 15 percent of PE presents as syncope. So it's in that list of, you know, most syncope people look well, but in those syncopes that don't look well, PE is a player in there. Okay. Uh, one of the comments during one of my lectures asked whether if you've given, if you've had an MRI with gadolinium, can you then breastfeed? And this gentleman looked up the uh, radiology recommendations and it says that you can, but if the mother's a little anxious about it, she can do the pump and dump for 24 hours and then begin breastfeeding, but you don't need to interrupt it, uh, at least by their radiology recommendations. Really? I'm surprised. Is oh, one other question that came up before you get to another question. Somebody asked me at the break um, what you all do for pain control for people with dental disease who don't have access to a dentist. Oh, I've never seen one of those. <laughs> and actually, so I'm kind of, and, and he wanted to sort of feedback from the group, all of those, you work in real places with real problems with no dentists. So, so I got what do some, you do? I got some real favorite strategies. One, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of doing apical blocks. I got it that learning the other dental blocks is a little bit tricky, and I'll, I'll do um, inferior alveolar nerve blocks on occasion. I don't personally do superior alveolar nerve blocks because I've seen people inject into the pterygo palatine fossa and cause that brainstem looking syndrome that freaks the shit out of you, so I don't do those. But the other thing I'm a big believer in is the tin of the viscous xylocaine with a Q-tip where the per you tell the person, dip the Q-tip in there and stick that in the hole that hurts the most. So I do the apical block that, and then they get a few of uh, what, you know, some, some compassionate use, Norco, six tabs, something like that, and say, this isn't going to last forever. They often also get some antibiotics to sort of clean this thing up before they go to the dentist to get it ripped. But that's my go-to, apical block, a little dab and go, uh, maybe a few pills, some antibiotics, and, you know, that tooth needs to be ripped out of your head. Um, sometimes I'll see them with it just dangling. I'll rip it out their head at that point. But uh, if, it, if it's going to require pliers, I believe it should be done by a dentist. If I can get it out with forceps, I'll do it. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. I appreciate the, the concept that the apical block separates uh, them into two populations, but I don't think that's true. And, and sometimes they often have um, carious disease that affects multiple teeth. There is one tooth that's really bugging them uh, where they have hot, cold dysesthesia or hyperesthesia, which is sort of a marker of endodontic disease, but they often have so referred I pain around it. I mean. Uh, when you look, I, I love the anthropology stories where there's this, there's this one place in France where at the bottom of a cliff, there's a whole bunch of skeletons. And it appears that prehistoric man used to leap to his death frequently off this cliff. And when they looked at the skulls, these people all were apparently dying of dental abscesses in the pre-dentistry days. Have any of you had a bad oh, toothache? God, I mean, it's, it's hell. Yeah. And I'm really impressed by that. My experience is very, I think, very impressive that the people who come in with this are usually poor, alcoholics, terribly malnourished, mal, they don't take care of themselves. They looked, they're everybody's notion of an abuser and they come in complaining and you give them an inf a block in the back tooth and they're, they, they will do any, they'll jump to their death for you. They are so grateful, you know, and it just, for me, it gives us, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that we are the ones who are the problem. That we, that our notion that everybody who who is asking for for pain relief is trying to abuse us is just plain wrong. And you know, this is the the classic stereotype of somebody who's looking for pain medicines, and you fix their dental pain, and they are so f grateful. 
One other thing I'll say, uh, if you and I have no stock in this product, there's a product out there called the Dental Box, and the what it has that's really helpful is is that a traditional plunger syringe when you're in someone's mouth, maybe with a bite block, trying to get visualization to do the apical block, the traditional syringe with the plunger is really hard to control, and that's why the dentists have those little finger long ones with the with the whole thing. And in the dental box are a couple of those syringes and they make all the difference in the world in terms of your ability to feel like you can accurately place an apical block. Well, I, I love these blocks. And get it done with a minimal amount of pain. I think so I'm, I'm a big fan of the most dental of box. Our, most of our, most people who do emergency medicine like doing procedures and I like doing procedures. I love doing dental blocks. They're really fun and, um, and they work so well. And uh, but I like Philly's notion as well that you give them a Q-tip and some lidocaine to go home with, because they're going to be a long. This is not going to be fixed until they see a dentist. And you know we can't solve the world's problems. We can only do our best. So oil of clove works too. Then get that over the counter. Well, don't forget your laryngoscope. Anytime you need to work in the mouth and you need a light oh, good source. Point. Good point. So if you've got that uh, peritonsillar abscess that you want to do really drain, the laryngoscope is just a great. Tongue depressor, light source, all in one. May there, our, our DLs may still have a role once we've gone to videoscopes for everything. It's, I, I just had that argument. I debated John Sackless, who, of course, has done all the studies on the superiority of video laryngoscopy versus DL. And I completely yield to his data. But one of the arguments I meant, made for you got to have the DL around is for this stuff. Yeah. looking in the mouth and doing procedures. And secondarily, I pointed out that the McGills don't work with the VL. So if they've got a hot dog blocking their trachea, the McGills are designed to work with your direct laryngoscope, but they don't work with the glide scope because the curves and the ergonomics are all wrong. So yeah, VL beats DL, I got it, but I still want to have a functional DL in the department at all times for a whole variety of reasons. One last thing about dental stuff um, that I just recently discovered Go back to your institution and talk to your social workers because if you have patient population that previously didn't have access to health care who now has it through the ACA, especially if it's a Medicaid-based insurance, the Dental Association, I don't know what lobby they did at, at Capitol Hill, but they get paid very well for emergent dental care. And actually kind of like those cases because they get paid very well. So see about setting up a system. And they get into with, the system. So yeah, their tooth is awesome. what provokes and this them is to something, get in. It's kind of like a little hidden thing out there, but they get they get paid well. So it's worth seeing in your community which dentists you know, are accepting the ACA Medicaid-based programs. And then they... They'll see them. They can see them the next day. They get paid very well for it. It's actually a nice resource that we never had until recently. White right. Fang, meet Obama. Go ahead. Nice. Shout it loud, the product. Dent temp. Dent temp? What is that? D-E-N-T. So it's eugenol? It has eugenol. Ah, okay. Which is oil of clove. So this is saying you, they've got endodontic disease. It's this sort of plasticky stuff you can jam into the top of the tooth like a filling. It's temporary. It's got eugenol in it, so the nerve is going to get a little a little uh, uh, eugenol oil of clove uh, extract on it, and uh, it's another adjunct that you can use. I think it's in the dental box. Is it, I was going to say, is it in that box? It's in the dental box, I think. I'm, not sure. I'm sure there are many products with it. But they can get it at Walmart. You can make yeah. your... Huh. Oh. Cool. Uh, There's enough in the pot for about five fillings. Great. I fill the one and give them... None of my people have five teeth, but I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> There are a couple questions about the evaluation of headache in the setting of concern for subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, the role of CT, CT alone, CT angiography, LP. Where does everybody stand on that? So um, I think Thumbs most up every time most people are aware of. I can't remember. Is it Perry? Perry. Perry. Uh, the six hour. If you've got the neuroradiologist reading your head CT and the time from the onset of headache to scan is under six hours. Uh, that study suggested that you're good to go. No further testing is needed. I think I've heard Jerry comment. That study that is an anti-pearl. He doesn't quite you know, buy it. 
it's, it's, that is the is a very misleading study. I think it's wrong. When I when we used to round when we were the senior residents and we'd have some old faculty dispensing anti pearls, um, and I can remember you have the intern standing next to you, the old faculty member st starts spouting something that's completely false. You have to lean over to the intern. Shields up. Incoming anti-pearl. Um, uh, that study is an incoming anti-pearl, and anyone who does med mal work will tell you that that's the case. And not that I want to teach to the tort, I don't. Um, but I, I, it's just not true. Jerry knows some more of the specifics about misclassification of patients, follow-up issues. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I agree that we should not believe this study. It's very, it's a very powerful one. It's a lot of people uh, think it gives us the answer and it does as David said it's it makes the claim that if you're in the first six hours and the CT is negative you're done and there are a lot of things that I think are wrong with that um, I just conceptually I just want to give you the concept of spectrum bias the CT is really really good for picking up a big bleed it's not gonna miss a hundred cc's of blood but um, but a big bleed you don't need any help with they're sick what you need help with is this the small Hessen Hunt class one headache only, where there's just a couple of CCs or a CC and there's not much blood there. And that's exactly the ones that the CTs, at least conceptually, you would think would have a lot of trouble with. That's the one where you need help, the one who isn't uh, clearly abnormal. So what's the evidence about that? Well, there are two types of evidence. There's lots and lots and lots of evidence not just legal cases, but in the literature about, you know, people got sent home with these big headaches and negative CT and they come back and now they have the rebleed and it's really hell to pay. And uh, this is, you know, subarachnoid warning leak is, is sort of the poster child for emergency medicine because it's the, it's the disease that says, that, that is the model for what we do. Why we exist. Right, we, we're there not for just the worst diseases, a lot of worst diseases you can't do anything about. What we're there for is something that if you pick it up today, it's great, you, the outcome's great. If you miss it today, there's hell to pay. This is a perfect example of that. There aren't a lot of these, but we spend a lot of time talking about it because it's so important to pick it up. So in any case, Perry said, no, no, you can pick it up with the early CT. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence that that's wrong. What was wrong with the Perry study? Two things. The majority of patients never got a definitive test. They didn't get an LP. So they said the CT is negative, therefore it's a true negative, unless they came back the next day dead. If they didn't come back to your place, we don't know. And there was at least 20% of them where there was no follow-up. So in Canada, you at least have to wait for the snow to melt <laughs> and see if there's some dead people in snowbanks. So I don't think they know that the ones that they sent home did okay, and that's one big problem. And the other big problem is they called it a true negative. There's evidence of this in the paper, although they don't talk about it. It's clearly there. If the patient, the, you give the CT, the radiologist read it as normal, you did an LP and the LP was positive. You called the radiologist and the radiologist said, oh, oh, yeah, there is blood. They called that a true positive, not a false negative. And to me, that's really a big issue. It's really easy to read a test once you know what the answer is. So there's, then, then there's the other great, thing let me just tell you, there's a famous study, one of my favorite studies, way back when, which looked at how well could radiologists on an IVP, or excuse me, on a plain film, identify which little calcification was a flebolith and which was a renal stone. And when they asked them to do it, radiologists who knew the results of the IVP, they were virtually 100% able to distinguish between the two. And then where they didn't show them the IVP beforehand, they were virtually 50%, that is flip a coin, no ability whatsoever to distinguish the two. Once you know the answer, it's really easy to do it. So I don't really care whether tomorrow, after they know that the person had a subarachnoid, somebody will reread it as, oh yeah, it was there, don't worry. I care about what's the reading you get in real time before you know the answer. And again, this is really crazy if in fact, they acknowledge that there were cases where they were told it was negative, then somebody discovered the bleed and then they said, oh yeah, it's really positive. That means they missed it on the CT. And they, how many of those were there? I have no idea. I know in my own practice, it happens fairly frequently. I've had many cases, 
frequently? No, there's only, I only see one sub warning leak a year, but I've had plenty of, one where, where the CT is negative. I've had plenty of cases in my own career Plenty, at least a half dozen, where the CT was read as negative. I called up the radiologist and said, I don't think so. And they said to me, oh, let, let me, hold on a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. So I don't believe that. The other thing that comes up with this is, well, I still don't need to do the LP because I'll just do the CTA on everyone. So let's talk about that for a second. So in this room, uh, before some people left, we were a little over 100 people which means uh, that there, there would be four, five, six aneurysms in the room, presumably without headaches. I know we can cause a headache up here, but presumably without headaches. So they don't know they have it. And so and going, most of those don't ever cause a problem. They'll never cause a problem. They're, go, they're born with it. They're going to die with it um, and not of it. And so what happens when you go with a CTA strategy first is you start now finding a bunch of people who they have an aneurysm, they have a headache, and it's true, true, unrelated. What are you going to do now? Those people are going to be followed and tortured for the rest of their lives. And there's going to be four or five of those for everyone where it's you found an aneurysm, they have a headache, and it's true, true, and related. So for every one of those where it's true, true, and related, there are going to be four or five where it's true, true, unrelated. So, and so it's a real quagmire to take the CTA approach first because of the baseline incidence of aneurysms in the general population and the enormous frequency of the chief complaint of headache. There, that, that does leave a, 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 an approach that is reasonable, however. So I'm a, personally, I'm an LP guy. I think that's what we should do. I don't think we need to do a CT in many of those cases, although I know I'm, I'm arguing, screaming, at, banging at the moon. But... Um, I think, you know, the test that you need to do, if you're really worried about uh, subarachnoid warning leak, you should do an LP. But I will say that there is an alternate strategy which I think is acceptable, which is as follows. You do a CT. If it's negative, which it's mostly going to be, no, CT. If it's negative, oh, which it going. mostly is, because most of them don't have the disease, and even of the ones who have the disease, some of them are going to be false negative, so most mm -hmm. of them are going to be negative. And by the way, you should... Your prior probability, right. if you list, if you do it, not I'm doing it on every bad headache, but I'm only doing it on sudden onset, worst at onset, you should be, your, your, your rule in rate should be 10 to 15%. If you're doing it on that, that means 85% still won't have it. Okay, okay, I do the CT, it's negative. The 85% who are negative, they're negative. And the, the other 15%, a few of them are going to be negative, probably half of them, probably, I think. But in any case, so I'm, I'm going to need to go further. Now I do the CTA. Now I see a positive. Well, Billy's right. I shouldn't believe that positive. But it's reasonable to say I could either do CTLP or I could do CTCTA. And if the CTA is positive, now I do an LP. That's the Because there's only going to be a few positives. And that way you would actually save some LPs. A lot and, of LPs. And mm -hmm. you could then say, but I don't know it's true. Now i got to look to see if there's blood. Right. And the ad other advantage of that is even if they bled and there's not an aneurysm, which is 15% of subarachnoids okay. are, we don't know where it came from. You had some blood in there. You had a bad headache. But they do fine in the long run. So you don't get that false positive tap, which is actually a true positive tap, but not from an aneurysm. So it, it, I, I like this approach. It, you still will find a few aneurysms where it is the true, true, and unrelated thing. And unfortunately, now that person knows they have an aneurysm, and what in the hell do we do now? Um, and that's up to the neurosurgeons to decide how to follow those things. But, but I think this approach keeps me from tapping a bunch of people. Uh, taps are, although they're relatively benign, they're not completely benign. If you use the pencil tip needles, at least your risk of a, of a post-LP headache is less, although not zero. It's down to single digits. It j I just think this approach makes some sense, and, and you have have to find out where your happy point place is, but it takes away that whole traumatic tap concern we, we from agree. a lot of people. She, Diane may choose that. I may choose the LP, but they're both. Those are both reasonable so strategies. So run this algorithm by me again. So CT, CTA. If the CTA is if the CTA Show is negative, you you're don't done. see anything. You're done because even if they had a small subarachnoid, it's not fixable and it's going to do fine. It wasn't an aneurysmal bleed. But if it's positive, no, it's still, tell. as Billy said, more likely to be a, a false positive than a true positive for a bleed. Yeah. So now I do the tap. And if the tap is blood, 
then they go to the neurosurgeon. If the tap is normal, now we got we've hurt somebody because now they know right, they now have they an aneurysm. aneurysm. So that's, that's why I don't like this as as much, but I think it's not unreasonable. Yeah. Comment. Oh, the time to LP. So no, peep, there's this whole argument that the LP that accent, needs I know a what little you do. time to incubate. <laughs> don't worry about it. That's I, the answer. I personally don't worry about it. But the uh, reason is that it takes 12 hours to be 100% sensitive, but it turns out it's 99.9% sensitive in two hours. So uh, if, uh, that's not what I'm worried about. It's a reportable case to have a false negative LP at any time. And don't use spectro, don't use uh, xanthochromia. Uh, huge numbers of false positives doesn't help you. Yeah, the xanthochromia thing is mostly done without a spectrophotometer. It's just holding it up against a white background and seeing if you see some, some yellowishness. And we've done some papers that say that just red cells alone, once the red cell count gets around 10,000, you get some xanthochromia, which is just sort of birefringence of the light around the periphery of the tube kind of effect. One more comment, we'll leave this. Uh, yeah, usually. Yes. Yeah. No, so yes. Neurosurgery. No, no, no. Because the question is, how many of these do you have to do? So, if, if when I do, if I do an LP first, it means I'm doing in 100 patients, I'm doing 100 LPs. If you were to do CT LP, you would still do end up doing 95 LPs, and you do 100 CTs. If you do um, my approach. Uh, you end up in, in CT for a very small number of people. So you're mostly doing LPs, but of the few that are positive, and occasionally because you get uh, you got a bloody tap and you couldn't go higher and, you know, you just can't know, you end up doing it anyway. But you're dramatically limiting the number of CTs and CTAs. I have to confess, I use some shared decision-making with the patient in these situations, and I've done it for a number of years, that... And it's also driven, I, I think some of a, we all will have a spectrum of concern for patients who come in with a sudden headache. You might get the person who looks just perfectly fine, but yet who's saying all the right things. And you're feeling obliged to do the workup, but in your heart, you're not terribly worried about the patient. And then there are people who legitimately look bad, you're truly worried. And so I think some of that drives my intrinsic mind gestalt pretest probability but I'll sometimes tell a patient especially if I've done the CT already that you know I thought maybe from the start there was about a five percent chance that you had this condition we're looking for um, and then the CT scan would pick up maybe 95 percent of those so you take one in 20 times one in 20 and you're down to about a one in 400 risk but yet it's a risk for a really bad thing it's a risk for a disabling stroke it's a risk for death and to me it's it's still a reasonable argument that patients can grasp and um, I've had some people say yeah I sure don't want to have one of them happen to me let's do the LP and I've had a lot of people say yeah, yeah I'm feeling pretty good now I think it's probably not that on remember account. that the I natural love history of this disease is the headache goes away right sentinel leak right. headache goes away I love the idea of shared decision making but I respectfully disagree with what David just said because I don't think that if you actually look at the numbers for how CT performs that the prior probability is actually decreased hardly at all if you have a negative CT because precisely the disease you're looking for is the one it doesn't find. And so I don't think, if, I don't think we should be doing it in, if your prior probability is so low that you're not really worried. We shouldn't do anything. And if your prior probability is high enough that you are worried, which should be about 10 to 15 percent in most cases, because that's the number you get if they had a sudden onset, worsted onset headache, then I don't think a negative CT gets me down hardly at all. So I think, for me, I don't think that's, you know, part of shared decision making is the patient gets the right information. And I can't prove this, but I don't think that's the right information. For me, the information is, I'm worried enough to start this process. The only way I'm going to be able to give you an answer is with one of the strategies we said. Go ahead, shout it out. No, same as CTA. Same. Pretty much the same. Um, and they don't find every single aneurysm. Remember, there's a size thing. They stop having sensitivity for them at around two millimeters. Um, and remember, you want to find what the aneurysm, again, back to Jerry's point, you want to find the aneurysms that are fixable, clippable, coilable. Um, and so those, are, those should be easily found by either MRA or CTA. 
Actually, one of the things Billy said that I think is, I, the residents come up with this every, it's sort of a reiterative teaching, but the, the key is headache of unusual severity and location, abrupt and onset, and it goes away. And it will go away with triptans, it will go away with morphine, it will go away with compazine, compazine. it will go with reglan, it will go away on its own. And it's that history alone that's enough. And the patient that's going to get you in trouble is the one that said, I had this, wow, gnarly headache driving to work this morning. It lasted about 20 minutes, and then it went away. And I'm just stopping by on the way home from work today because I just kind of, I just want to get checked out. Because that's I had a sense of lead. doom when it happened. Well, no, <laughs> seriously, these are the ones that your temptation is to just say, oh, it was nothing. How many of you have had a patient, because I've had this several times, I bet there's somebody here who's had it, where the patient is, I had this, this horrible, horrible, it was the worst thing ever, headache. When was it? Three days ago. Well, why'd you wait to come in? I was too sick. I'm, I'm, I'm better now. That, well, that to me is out. like, that's subarachnoid. So uh, the other paper that's in the database on this topic that I, I particularly like, um, because this is an easy disease to miss, I think, even with all the strategy things and all the stuff we're talking about, um, as p important as it is, it's still easy to miss, is a study that we did that was done in Scandinavia, and it was Sweden, where they have a closed system so that everyone, and they took all confirmed cases of bloody aneurysms, so the ones that died, the ones that were found at post, because some people get autopsies there, the ones that were confirmed by whatever mechanism. And um, they, so they had this pool of people we know had the disease. They had this badness. And then they just tracked their healthcare system back for the prior six months and said, hmm, wonder how many of them presented with a bad headache to their regular doctor at any time in that period. And what they found was that like 45% of them had been to their doctor for something that could easily have been, you know, I don't, no one knows and they didn't pretend to know in the paper. But, the, you know, you look at it and you go, geez, I bet that was a sentinel leak. If Had they gotten the real workup, it would have been found then. Um, and the reason I like that study so much is because it says, if you ask me what it says, it says the standard of care is to miss this a lot. This is an interesting question. Uh, there's a bit of a lead in here, but I love the final takeaway. It says, my ED is high elevation, about 8,000 feet. Average patient has SATs around 90%, pulse of 110, respiratory rate of 24. Most decision-making tools are not helpful to us, at least not for PE, pneumonia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Since I'm, Move. That's since the answer. I, I dropped the rules. Uh, uh, since I'm making gestalt-based decisions anyway, is there literature to support gestalt? And I think the good answer is yes. yes. Yeah, there's lots so of So even the AHA, even the AHA guidelines, the 2014, say that yes, we've got all these decision rules. If you want for ACS, the Sanchez rule, the Hess rule, the Hart score, so forth. Um, but none of them have been proven better than clinical same gestalt. Thing with PE. Remember PE what I said: same. if there's nine versions of a decision instrument, it means none of them work. It cannot be that they work because they're the all bit created by data torturing, and if they don't agree with each other, that means whatever this rule was didn't work in the other five. Whatever that rule was doesn't work in this one. The beauty of working at 8,000 feet is you have a diagnosis for every vagoma that comes in. Altitude I'm sorry illness. you have acute mountain sickness. That's We're right. going to put you on some oxygen. You'll <laughs> feel better in a little bit. So all the vague, you, you may not be able to know what to do with some of these more serious things, but you have the answer for every vagoma. That's only for visitors. That's only for visitors. <laughs> for visitors, true. Yeah. That's a... There's yeah, it, and as these guys said, wherever it's been studied, clinical gestalt is at least as good. Typically, it's, it's as sensitive and more specific than any of these deci complicated decision instruments. There's a question about steroids. Are oral, effect, or oral steroids as effective as parenteral steroids for all the indications we use it as? Yes. 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 So steroids have been looked at extensively. And so uh, one thing that comes out pretty consistently is that the higher dose of steroids, as soon as you push towards sort of two per kilo, you don't get any more benefit. You do get some more side effects. So you, should, you want to be shooting sort of for the one per kilo range, for, for example, with prednisone. And in terms of even really specific inflammatory conditions like bicipital tendonitis or, or uh, de Quervain's tenosynovitis, where people are nervous about, like, I don't know the anatomy well enough to inject that. All the literature says you don't really know the anatomy, need to know the anatomy that well, that it's Put like it horseshoes. <laughs> that you, if you're anywhere in the vicinity, you're probably good enough. In fact, you could be so far out of the vicinity that you thought that injecting it into their buttocks was the right place, and it would still work 
just about as the small amount. Great and by the way, study that looked at this wonderful study for shoulder stuff that looked at this. You know, sham in the shoulder, real in the butt, sham in the butt, real in the shoulder, and Ooh, like it worked that. the that's same. That's a nice song. Sham in the shoulder. Sham in the real shoulder. Real in the butt. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think that's a rap tune. <laughs> and, you, and it works just as well if you give it by mouth. That's yeah. what I think is an interesting concept, and I've started to switch to this recently. Is there's no magic, as we've talked about, that you know, verapamil and diltiazem are about the same for AFib. Um, there's no magic that says you need uh, prednisone for asthma and decadron for your sore throat. Right. Right, so right. they all work the same. And decadron, of course, has a much longer half-life. So there's some PEDS literature, and I don't know yeah. about any in adult, but it, it intuitively makes sense that uh, why not use something like decadron in the adult asthma exacerbation? You could give a dose in the ED. Maybe you're done. Maybe you have one more dose to give in two Certainly or three days. Certainly with croup, we know that if you send the kid home on the oral prednisone, which takes like, tastes like caca and makes them cough and have a renewal of their croup exacerbation because they're coughing so hard, that they have fewer returns if you put the prednisone in the butt. Because well, but then they can't not take it. But dexamethasone so is great compliance. for croup because it lasts just as long as croup does. Right. Remember we did, how long do upper respiratory infections last? Some of them last forever. Croup Croup's lasts two days. Yeah. Perfect. Two days. Right. Well, that's the argument for using decadron in asthma. Yeah, yeah I am decadron in the butt for croup. Although no. for asthma, I think, you know, you're going to have a lot of failures weeks. at two days. You, you probably need five days, something like that. And there's an occasional patient leads a little more. So, but but the, the concept is a, is, a, is a very reasonable one. One other thing to remind you is don't ever give a medrol dose pack. A medrol dose pack, first of all, is 10 times more expensive than the prednisone in it. And its only value is that it treats patients like morons. They can't figure out what to do. And they, they, they don't know how to wean it. And particularly because you don't need to wean it because you do not get adrenal suppression for at least two weeks of high-dose prednisone. So if you're giving five days, you should give five days and stop, period. You don't need to wean it. You don't need, and to, to make it complicated and expensive is, is bad. Comment. My understanding is Yeah, I don't know if that's true. I, I don't take I don't a lot of either of them. Not, but so behind I think, you is I think not, our pediatricians say that. No, I just the, I actually don't know personally, but the person behind you is nodding quite vigorously. So yes, it's true. Yeah. Cr- no, no, it, it, that's absolutely true. Comment here. Yes. It's I do, cheap. I, I, I give, it's cheap. I mm-hmm. neb dexamethasone for anytime I see someone who has that cough induced asthma where they have that irritability, they cough, then they start wheezing. I'll neb them some dex for that. The, the RTs are always like, how much? I'm like, how much do you have in your hand? That much. You know, whatever they got. They, I don't care which vial it is. The so four, there are, the ten, there dump are, that in there. There are rheumatologic diseases where the dose of steroids is very important. Right. And, um, but for the things we treat, the vast majority, my reading of the literature is it doesn't matter what dose you give, what route you give, none of that. You've got to give some. And so with that in mind, give a, a, um, a lower dose. <laughs> so, you know, 40 of prednisone is a standard dose or one per kilo is the kid's dose. That's plenty. And you, for most things, you don't need it for very long. There are a couple of questions about evaluation when you're concerned about appendicitis. Do we go to ultrasound? Do we go to CT? Uh, this is one of those topics that I think is evolving. Uh, is it in the ASEP um, choosing wisely? Oh, for pediatrics it is. So sure. I think the choosing wisely current iteration says that if you're concerned about appendicitis in peds, then ultrasound is your initial test. Um, for adults, I think the European literature is much more robust, and we talked about a bit that this morning, that they're really good with ultrasound. Um, I think if we never do it, we'll never get good at ultrasound, uh, but it, it's certainly a challenge, and if you do this serially, you, you order your appy ultrasound, 
and it's negative, then three hours later, you're now ordering your CT scan. Or not negative, not visualized. Right. right. Well, yeah. yeah. And actually, didn't for, help for you. your institution, if your um, ultrasonographers don't have a lot of experience with this, one of the things we've heard through these yeah. courses is that you'll go ahead and use your go-to test, which is the CT, but if the ultrasound tech has time, they know the appy is there, they can actually go do this study and get some experience under their belt. Yeah, um, so there are places which have it that it's yeah. mandatory if you're going to do one, you do both so that people will learn, and that's, that's really They don't a, charge a for both, idea. it's just an educational One other thing tool. to just remember is that um, any imaging actually changes outcomes for the benefit in females where you're looking for appendicitis, but the, there's really pretty good evidence that it doesn't change anything for the benefit in males. Now that's not gonna convince your surgeons or your hospital to allow you to do, to be rational in a young man who clearly has appendicitis doesn't need any imaging, but keep that in mind. And the reason I mention that is because Ultrasound, this is not like ultrasonography for many of the things we do where it's pretty easy, we can learn it, etc. This is a tough test, and it depends upon the person. Are, do they have, uh, are they too fat, are they too thin? You know, there, there are many different things, and is it a woman or is it a man? But ultrasound can be tremendously helpful in women where very often the obvious clinical diagnosis is wrong. It's not wrong in an important way because they're going to need the OR or not anyway, but is it really a pelvic disease or is it an, a, um, a, an appy? We get that wrong clinically all the time. In young men, we don't what get it wrong. It it's obvious. So, you know, which one you use is not a one size fits all. Comments? Okay. Uh, two people asked about this, and I have to confess, I don't know the literature, so maybe someone else up here does. Zofran on Dancitron in pregnancy. I guess there's a lot of hype maybe Yeah, out so there. there's been some recent uh, talk that this is uh, Class C, I want to say, and so you ought to, to use the B. other. Is class it, C is ev just about every drug that you use right. is Class C. Almost nothing has been proven to be safe, and the ones you know about are the dangerous ones are very, 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 very few. Most worries about, oh my God, are based on some patient had a bad outcome and got a medicine, and then somebody makes a big fuss that, oh, that must be the medicine, and when it's studied epidemiologically, it almost never is. So I don't know that there's any evidence that this is there been a, There has been a flurry of activity on this, and I, I don't know the details, but I know that our OBs backed off Zofran within the last six months, because we were using it uh, relatively freely in hyperemesis gravidarium and some other um, emesis conditions that are, are, are encountered, um, but and they backed away from it. And I, I don't know if there was some published case. I don't know if there was a lawsuit. I don't know what exactly. Something's happened in that world that's causing a, a so glitch these are with types no of brand. things. Whether where it's real fact or just anecdote, I don't know. Think about it. Unless it's thalidomide, where they're dropping like flies. These are really hard to figure out. So if it is true that it's dangerous, it wouldn't be surprising that it took us a long time to know it, and now it's turning out, and we should be worried. On the other hand, most cases where people say, oh, my God, it turns out it's not true. So I don't think, I'm not aware of any evidence that this is true, but that doesn't mean that it isn't. I would stay tuned. There's some little buzz about this going on. I don't know what it is. The two antiemetics that have been, I don't know if Zofran's changed, has been class B. Zofran and metoclopramide are both class B, so you, last I checked. Actually, it's a good point. And actually, I think I've seen things, I think I've seen things debunking this, but I, I can't check. say for sure. Remember that there was a really safe, cheap, easy antiemetic called Bentil years ago, which got taken off the market because of this exact thing, and despite huge evidence that it was at least as safe as any other antiemetic. So uh, there's a lot of fright with this because, you know, there's a lot of miscarriages, and was it the antiemetic? And so it's easy to get this wrong. I don't. You know, we'll see, but I, I, I'd be surprised if it turns out it's true. So it's Class B. We just looked it up. Yeah. Um, I think there's something happening. I gotta figure it out. If it's Class right. B, that's way better than most drugs. All right, we have uh, four minutes to approach shortness of breath investigation in the pregnant patient. Uh, this has come up a little bit, a couple times here. Um, we did acknowledge, and I think one of our literature sessions, that there is at least some suggestion, certainly not well validated, that 
you can try to raise your D-dimer threshold, your cutoffs over time as you f get farther into the pregnancy. So there's a rule of thumb, but I think most of us would agree when Diane said that it's not well validated and it's hard to hang your hat on it. Um, and it's going to be fraught with problem if you even send your D-dimer off on a pregnancy I'm patient. I'm going to make a different suggestion. What is the, how much does pregnancy, let me, let's go back to birth control pills because this we know the answer. How much do birth control pills raise the risk, the relative risk of having a PE? Not much. Maybe two-fold, maybe five-fold at most. What is the risk of a PE in a typical young woman of childbearing age? Pretty close to zero. What's 10 times zero? <laughs> so I, I want to, I'm going to make this point because I think it's really the first question is why do we get so crazy when somebody is on birth control pills? If they don't look like a PE, birth control pills doesn't mean it's a PE, doesn't mean you should worry. If it doesn't look like a PE, we've gotten ourselves a lot of problem by starting chasing it down in women just on birth control pills. Well, what's the evidence for pregnancy? There's less evidence, but the best evidence suggests that the same is true, that pregnancy raises your chance by a very small amount, ex with the exception of at the time of delivery, late third trimester, and particularly just postpartum. That's where you should be a little more worried. It still doesn't mean you should be worried if the person has nothing. They just had a little funny pain that is irrelevant that they don't have a PE. But don't miss it in somebody just because they're young if it's around that time. So for me, the real question is not what you should do, what, how you should look at the D-dimer, but how many patients can you say, no, I'm sorry, I don't, they, yes, they were, they're three months pregnant, but this is not a PE. And I think the answer is almost all of them. If they really look like a P, then realize that there's a slightly higher risk if they're on hormones, they are pregnant, and a particularly higher risk if they're at the time of delivery. But so other than that, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny factor, and we way overinflate it. So true, uncomplicated pregnancy, but now make a pregnancy where they were put on a month of bed rest. So you're adding now stasis, plus a slight increased hypercoagulable state. Now, so Virchow's triad, which is endothelial cell disruption, stasis, um, and hypercoagulable state, is really much more effective when two parts of the triangle or three parts of the triangle involved. So I think that you gotta be a little careful. I think everything Jerry said there was true for pregnancy, but make it a complicated pregnancy where she's been put in a month of bed rest, you got a different game to play. Um, because now you've added another element of virtue so triad. It's a revolutionary thought. Use some judgment and think. And of course, yep. the more things there are, the more you'd be concerned. Even with that being said, though, the actual incidence of PE in pregnancy, other than at the time of delivery, is teeny, teeny, teeny. And to reemphasize something I had said earlier this week that watchful waiting, or what, as I mentioned, has also been called masterful inactivity, is a perfectly reasonable approach for these well-looking people. PE is on the differential, but there's no physiologic derangements. You could say, look, I don't think so. Let's have you back with your doctor tomorrow. Certainly come back if anything gets worse. You don't really need to come up with the answer today. Uh, but also to touch on the pregnancy talk, the CT MRI talk I gave this morning, if ultimately, for whatever reason, you're doing the workup, CT PA is, is safe as best we understand in pregnancy. It is a radiation exposure, but if you need to do it, you can do it and not feel so right, crazed so about it's it. It's less radiation to the fetus. Yeah, than the uh, VQ scans. Yeah, because the, 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 the dye the gathers fetus. in the bladder and exposes the fetus on okay. the VQ. All so right, the CTPA is less to the fetus, good. which is Time usually the winner. decision maker.